Jim probably doesn't need a whole lot of introduction, but I do have some things here, so I'm going to mention them. Um, of course, you know he's an economist in the research department of the Canadian Auto Workers, Canada's largest, the largest private sector union. He received his PhD in economics in 1995 from the New School for Social Research in New York. He also holds economics degrees from Cambridge University in the UK and University of Calgary. He is the author of Paper Boom and co-editor of Challenging the Market, The Struggle to Regulate Work and Income, and his column appears in the Globe and Mail. And otherwise, I'm sure that you're familiar with Jim from uh, CBC Radio and many other media out outlets. Um, he is, in my view, an activist economist extraordinaire he is comfortable in any venue, and please relax and prepare to be entertained. He is funny, engaging, he speaks in plain language, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. Wow, I can't wait to meet that guy. <laughs> You're it. Patty, the only thing you left off the list uh, bears a striking resemblance to Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> <laughs> and uh, possesses uh, rippling washboard abs. <laughs> you might have left that one off. But, uh, anyways, thank you very much. And uh, thank all of you for uh, giving up a good Wednesday evening, a rainy Wednesday evening, but a good Wednesday evening to come and hear about uh, austerity and economics and listen to an economist uh, talk for a bit. They say, I, I should warn you, an economist is someone who's good with numbers, but didn't have the personality to become an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of the buyer beware warning that I have to give uh, at the beginning. There's coffee uh, at the back uh, for anyone who's desperate. Um, I love uh, London. I love what the labor movement uh, is doing in London with the bridges that you're building and the alliances. Uh, I see it in the common front. Uh, I see it in the, the bonds between Occupy and the, and the movement that we talked about. I see it in uh, Chief Miskolman's presence uh, tonight. We're very honored by that, uh, sir, and on, by what your movement is doing. And uh, it's a wonderful model of community engagement and uh, all unions uh, can learn from it. So uh, thank you very much uh, for that. So um, I have got so many buttons to push over there. I am actually going to uh, pull a uh, Oprah Winfrey act here. <laughs> and I know I'm messing up your uh, photo here. So, <laughs> sir, how do you feel about Lance Armstrong? I like his bicycle. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to migrate over here so I can uh, push the push the buttons. If you were a very good mind reader there, uh, with uh, with Bryn's presentation, is that awesome or what? Do you know how long Bryn's been on the job? All of three weeks. <laughs> three weeks on the job, but look at that. The <laughs> UFL's new researcher, I think, is actually your job, right? I think uh, you got a promotion there, Curtis and Ty, but uh, you're actually the researcher, and uh, we look forward to wonderful, wonderful stuff. So. Uh, my job tonight is to try and debunk some of the uh, logic, the phony logic, the self-defeating logic of austerity by taking us back to a little bit of history, not ancient history, pretty recent history, about where this deficit came from, what caused it, and what we actually have to do to solve the deficit. And uh, in the course of that recent history lesson, uh, we will see that uh, austerity uh, is not going to solve the problem. In fact, austerity could very well make the problem worse. Uh, and that's what I mean by self-defeating uh, logic. So um, I know some of, the, some of these points will, should be self-evident. They should be obvious for anyone who is reading the newspapers over the last five years, okay? But uh, are conveniently forgotten when it comes time to twist the screws on working people, on our working conditions and our wages, and our pensions and our benefits, and most of all, of course, our public services uh, that we pay for through our hard-earned uh, taxes. So, the first of these obvious, if forgotten, truths, okay, the recession caused the deficit, not the other way around, okay, we don't have an economic crisis because we had a deficit, we have a deficit because we had an economic crisis, and it was not a question of so-called overspending, 
uh, it was a deeper structural problem in our economy that caused uh, this deficit. And this is what I mean by the forgotten history. It wasn't that long ago, in fact, five years ago, that Ontario's budget was balanced. It was balanced on average for an entire decade until 2008. Uh, in the period of that decade, especially the latter part of the decade, uh, from 2003 to 2008, after we booted uh, Mike Harris uh, out of office, uh, okay, we actually did manage to have some modest increases in program spending, in our uh, education spending, in our healthcare spending, and a few other programs. Uh, yet despite that, despite those modest spending increases, we more than balanced the budget. Uh, in fact, we ran small surpluses uh, on average. Uh, it was only when we entered an unprecedented financial and economic crisis, uh, the worst since the Great Depression of the 1930s, that we then began to experience provincial deficits. And there is absolutely no evidence, no empirical or economic evidence that can make the case that our deficit was caused by too much spending. Because until 2008, uh, we had uh, balanced budgets and in fact, uh, slight uh, surpluses. What happened with the recession was you had fewer people in Ontario working, so, duh, you had fewer people in Ontario paying income taxes from their jobs. Guess what? You don't need a PhD in economics to put two and two together on that score. Fewer people working means fewer income taxes. Less income to spend means less sales taxes. So the revenue side uh, fell uh, uh, because of the recession. There's somewhat of a jump in the spending side because of the recession, because we still have a bit of a social safety net. It's flawed, okay? There's yawning gaps in our social safety net, so many of the people who need help because of the crisis aren't getting it. But there is still a bit of an uptick in spending that's related to the recession. And that combination uh, took us from a balanced budget or even a slight surplus uh, into the deficits that we have experienced first, uh, more recently. So, the uh, key point to keep in mind is, uh, where, what caused this crisis? How did we end up in this mess uh, in the first place? And this, again, is where uh, they're trying to rewrite history. If you read the newspapers today, you'd think that the crisis was caused by unionized garbage collectors, you know, who seem to take uh, too much money uh, to do their job. Or teachers, okay, it's obvious, teachers and their, uh, their demands uh, caused the, the crisis. Or probably auto workers. Auto workers and their wage demands caused the crisis. Uh, in fact, of course, it was none of the above. Uh, they want to make it seem like the crisis was this random negative event that happened. You know, like a comet hurtling towards Earth that they're un, uh, unable to predict or, or stop. Okay, it's just this random uh, negative event. Or if in doubt, blame it on the unions. In fact, of course, this is where the crisis came from. Uh, it came from these uh, subsidized casinos of the financial system, the guys in red jackets uh, who instead of actually producing something useful like uh, teaching, right, or working in a hospital or collecting garbage, they just go to these casinos and uh, in essence play with paper, uh, buy low, sell high and hope to profit uh, from the difference. And uh, this is where the crisis started. This is why Ontario got dragged into it, uh, yet the uh, history is forgotten. We should take a moment, it's very important for the labor movement to have a storyline and to remind ourselves and our allies and our neighbors and our workmates about what caused the crisis in the first place. How did we end up with this economic hangover, uh, if you like, uh, in the picture that we're still uh, suffering from? Because it has nothing to do with all of the things that the right wing is going after uh, in this period of uh, austerity. It has nothing to do with public services, has nothing to do with unions, has nothing to do with wages. Uh, the crisis that we're still suffering from was still the after effect of a speculative bubble in the financial markets. It's not the first time it's happened, and it won't be the last time either, unless we fundamentally change the rules about how the private financial system works. This bubble was rooted, as you know, in the U.S. housing market, which uh, tripled in price uh, on average between 1999 and 2006 an enormous uh, run-up in prices that was not sustainable and that was driven by enormous injections of credit, almost like uh, pumping air into a big inflating balloon, the credit that was pumped in by an irresponsible, short-sighted banking system. And uh, you had a situation where people were speculating on the real estate bubble, not just on real estate itself, but more importantly on financial derivatives related to real estate, 
things with names that you can barely pronounce, like credit default swaps or collateralized debt obligations. Pieces of paper, not actual buildings, pieces of paper that they bought with borrowed money and hoped to sell uh, for more than they uh, paid for. And uh, they would borrow money, uh, $50 of money, for every dollar of their own that they placed in bets on real estate and real estate derivatives. Uh, try that yourself the next time you go to uh, a casino. If you, uh, any of you ever go to a casino, okay, try going up to the blackjack table, say, okay, and take a loony out of your pocket and put the loony down on the table and say, okay, I'm betting $50 on the next hand, okay? <laughs> And the dealer's going to say, well, where the hell's the other 50, the, re the rest of $50? And then you say, I'm borrowing it from you. <laughs> okay? Do you think that'll work? No, he's going to call security and you're going to get tossed out of the casino as some kind of fraudster, right? Uh, uh, yet if you try that in the financial world, you know, it's called a, a, a leveraged bet. And you can actually write off the interest on the money that you borrowed, assuming that the bet pays off. The problem is, if you lose big on the bets, well, you lose your dollar, but the people who lent you 50 lose the 50. So guess who's in more trouble? The people who lent you the 50. And when the whole bubble began to burst, as bubbles <coughs> always do, one of my favorite economic quotes is from John Kenneth Galbraith, the Canadian who then went south and became famous in America, just like um, Celine Dion, you know, or something like that. Okay, he said, um, uh, a balloon never pops in an orderly manner. Okay, and the same was true of the financial bubble, of course. Uh, one thing led to another, the speculators went broke, the banks that lent to the speculators went broke, the banks that lent to the banks that lent to the speculators went broke, and we ended up in a worldwide uh, recession uh, because of the collapse in credit, the collapse in confidence, everybody cut back their spending, and, uh, every, and um, mass unemployment uh, resulted. The interesting thing about this crisis, what did that have to do with Ontario? Okay, we weren't doing that for the most part, but we got dragged into it along with most of the rest of the world. In fact, 2009 was the first time since the end of World War II that global GDP actually declined. It was the first synchronized worldwide recession, and it's because the banks of the world, including our own, were so much integrated into that casino economy that when things went south, okay, or uh, if I can use a technical term in economics, when the shit hit the fan, <laughs> okay, I should define I should define the terms as I go along, Patty. You know, being a popular educator, you can't use jargon. Shit hit the fan means asset portfolio dramatically underperformed expectations. Okay, so, just to be clear, what I mean when the shit hit the fan, okay, everybody was invested in this global casino and credit conditions uh, crunched, okay, and you had banks in Iceland that collapsed because the real estate market in Florida went south. What was that about? Why on earth did banks in Iceland collapse because of something that happened in Florida? It was because the banks in Iceland had been privatized by a conservative government, and the first thing the private banks there did was get in on the action and start betting on paper instead of doing what banks are supposed to do, which is create credit at a slow, sustainable uh, uh, pace in order to support real growth and real job creation uh, in the economy. So. Uh, it was a worldwide recession and it did affect Canada, despite all of the endless back padding that Stephen Harper and Jim Flaherty and all of them in Ottawa have been doing. I mean, they must have a repetitive strain injury by now. <laughs> try, try this, folks. Try doing this for a few minutes. Your arm gets extremely sore, but they've been doing it for five years saying, hurrah, hooray for Canada, we avoided it. We didn't avoid it. We had a recession. We've had a very, very anemic recovery. Almost, I would call it a non-recovery. Things in the labor market are almost as bad as they were at the worst stage of the recession. And our uh, performance has lagged far behind many other countries uh, in the world, places like Germany, Korea, Australia, of course, the emerging market economies. They always say, well, at least we're not as bad as the United States, you know. And that's like somebody jumping off the building and at the 23rd floor saying, well, I'm still alive, you know? It's not much of a comparator, okay? Uh, and in fact, Canada uh, was dragged in uh, and uh, dragged in relatively badly. Our performance has been very much subpar. Now we're in a, a new chapter of the same uh, sad book, and the, a new, the new trend globally towards worldwide austerity, cutbacks in spending, layoffs, taking away uh, benefits, taking away programs, 
that global austerity is very much uh, a new stage of exactly uh, the same crisis, and we're experiencing that in Canada completely needlessly. Then think back to the uh, very first uh, part of the presentation. What caused this crisis in the first place? It was the meltdown of an unsustainable, deregulated, private, profit-driven financial system. Well, guess what? Canadian banks were part of that system. It's another enormous myth that Canadian banks uh, were not bailed out. Canadian banks absolutely were bailed out. $120 billion of federal aid went to the Canadian banks in all kinds of different ways. Now, the banks survived and were immediately profitable again, so they paid back that money to the government, but that doesn't mean they weren't bailed out. And Canadian banks are still, uh, in some ways, inherently fragile. They were all just downgraded by Moody's, of all people, yesterday, or the day before yesterday. And the reason they were downgraded is because their, their business involves taking a certain amount of money and recycling it 20 times over in loans, uh, but there's only 1 20th of the amount of money in the actual bank, which means Canadian banks could collapse the minute there's a collapse in confidence. Now, 20 times over is better than 50 times over, which is what the American and European banks were doing. That's why Canadian banks are relatively stronger, but they're still leveraged 20 to 1, which means uh, for every dollar that somebody puts in the bank, the bank lends it out 20 times, uh, in essence. So. The Canadian banking system is not immune, and if we don't look back to the fundamental cause of the problem, if we continue to be distracted by these attacks on public sector workers and teachers and garbage collectors and auto workers, instead of looking at the true source of the problem, which was unregulated greed in a private industry, okay, that is the true source of the problem, not bloated government, okay, unregulated greed in a private industry is the key source uh, of the problem, and we can't uh, forget it. In terms of the history of Ontario's budget, okay, this shows our uh, budget balance. If it's above the line, it's a surplus. If it's below the line, it's a deficit in the 10 years leading up to the uh, financial crisis. One year there was a significant deficit. That was 2003, the last year that Harris and Eves were in power. Harris and Eves were in power. They were desperate to stay in power, so they started spending money uh, trying to buy votes, and we had a one-year deficit. Uh, it was a political deficit more than an economic deficit. But that was quickly resolved, and for the decade as a whole, we had a small surplus on average, even though, as I said, we were modestly increasing our program spending. Then along came the financial crisis, and this is what we got stuck with. Uh, it was no dramatic change in public programs. There was no dramatic change in collective bargaining for teachers or garbage collectors or any other public sector workers, but there was a meltdown uh, in a private financial industry because we allowed those people to play without adult supervision, in essence, uh, is what we did. And now we're all paying the price for it in terms of uh, large deficits. The deficit in 2009 provincially was over 3% of GDP, and that's a big deficit by, by any definition, especially for a subnational level of government. So we can't pretend there was no deficit, but we have to understand what caused the deficit. It was the crisis that caused the deficit. And then we have to understand how to solve it, which is slowly, steadily put Ontario back to work, pay our taxes, and then we'll be able to pay the cost of public services. And that's exactly what we've been doing in the last four years. Even though the recovery here has been very weak uh, by c comparison to previous recoveries, because this crisis was especially deep, we're still dramatically uh, paying off uh, uh, our deficit, reducing our deficit. Initially, the uh, deficit was forecast to be as much as $25 billion for Ontario. It came in at much lower than that. $19 billion was the worst. We already got it down to $11 billion, and uh, we're continuing to shrink it just through the slow, steady work of being careful on the spending, of course, but uh, putting Ontarians back to work and growing our revenue base as the main uh, driver, and we can continue to do that. Um, this is the current estimate from the uh, provincial government about uh, the deficit for 2012-2013, the year that's about to end. They say it will be uh, 11 billion. Originally, they forecasted as much, much larger than that. It came in uh, um, at least, it will come in at least $3 billion lower than their initial budget. And this is part of an age-old game that finance ministers always play to try and make the thing look worse than it is, to scare people into accepting things that they don't actually have to accept. And it's, uh, it's absolutely insulting uh, that they cook the numbers, they build in all kinds of contingencies, all kinds of cushions uh, in every piece of the budget, and then at the end of the day, they stand up in the, in the uh, Queen's Park and say, look at me, thanks to my prudent fiscal management, we're $3 billion under our target. 
uh, elect me again. And uh, of course, it's a game. It's a game about shifting the goalposts so you think you're further <coughs> ahead than you actually are. In reality, yes, it's a deficit. It was a big deficit in 09. We're working it off, and we will continue to work it off as uh, we go forward. The claim that we're out of spending, or, or, uh, sorry, out of control uh, with our spending, that we're about to approach a debt wall, that the whole province is going to go broke, uh, <coughs> is uh, nonsense. As I mentioned, our program spending did grow modestly uh, in the period up to 2008, but our budget was balanced as we went forward. Uh, provincial program spending in Ontario was still low relative to most other provinces and territories uh, in Canada. Uh, compared to what other provinces deliver in terms of healthcare, education spending, and other provincial programs, uh, Ontario is still relatively tight-fisted. Even the Drummond Report acknowledged that. The Drummond Report acknowledged that Ontario does not overspend relative to uh, the rest of Canada. The rise in the debt burden, properly measured in Ontario, despite this unprecedented financial crisis, uh, has been modest. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is the interest rate question. As you know from a mortgage on a house, how much you can sustainably borrow depends totally on your income, first of all, okay, which for Ontario is uh, our GDP, that means putting people back to work, and secondly, it depends on the interest rate. If the interest rate is lower, then the burden of carrying a certain uh, level of debt uh, will be lower uh, with a lower interest rate. We've seen record low interest rates uh, in Canada, partly because of the depth of the financial crisis, and the interest rates in Ontario are going to stay low, and in fact, they're going to keep falling on an average effective basis. Even if we get to a point in a couple of years where interest rates start to grow again, and that point is still some ways off, uh, the U.S., for example, has committed to not increase interest rates till at least 2015, okay? So it's at least a couple more years before we'll see any turnaround in interest rates. Um, the average effective rate that Ontario pays will continue to shrink even after that. For this reason, many of the government bonds that were issued in, the, say, the 1990s or the 1980s or even the 2000s were issued at much higher interest rates, even like 10 or 11 percent interest rates. As those bonds come due, they're now being refinanced at two and a half, three percent interest rates. And that's occurring all the time. So that's going to keep bringing down the average weighted interest rate that Ontario pays on its debt. And that means that the interest cost uh, side of things uh, will continue to shrink. The irony is, Ontario is paying less interest on its debt today than they were when the crisis hit, even though the debt has grown modestly because of those uh, deficits. So, no real need to panic here. This is a, a measure of uh, Ontario's accumulated deficit, uh, that is, the sum total of all the deficits that are incurred each year, relative to the size of our GDP. And uh, it declined during that decade when we had uh, surpluses uh, on average. It has begun to increase again since 2008 when the crisis hit, but the rate of increase has slowed down because the size of the deficit uh, has shrunk. Uh, we'll be at a point within the next year or two that that measure, the debt as a share of GDP, will start to decline. Even before we get to a balanced budget, the debt burden as a share of GDP will start to decline because our economy is growing uh, at the same time. So. Is this something that we should keep an eye on? Absolutely. Ontario is a subnational government. It can't print money. It doesn't control its own banks. So there's only so much that it can borrow. But our debt burden, despite the crisis, is still much, much lower than it was 10 or 15 years ago and is not remotely in the state of emergency realm that you'd think it was if you uh, simply read uh, the business headlines or uh, the political uh, propaganda. So, obvious truth number one, the recession caused the deficit. Obvious truth number two, fix the recession, you'll fix the deficit. I know that's an astounding insight, isn't it? That's, that's why I went to post-secondary education for 10 years of my life, so I could come up with brilliant statements like that one. Uh, fix the recession and you'll fix the deficit. Uh, it's the obvious uh, counter uh, uh, to the first uh, statement. Uh, this is a graph that shows Ontario's uh, GDP and the trend before the crisis hit. Uh, on average, Ontario's GDP would grow in nominal terms by about 4.5% a year. That reflected a combination of inflation each year, around 2% a year, and uh, increases in the real output of our workers in Ontario uh, because of growing employment and growing productivity. So we carried along at that trend rate. Then, of course, uh, the recession hit. We fell below the trend. 
And uh, as I mentioned, we've been in so-called recovery, but you notice the gap between the trend, which is where we should be. That's how much we're capable of producing, given our population and our technology and our productivity. The red line shows what we're actually producing in light of the recession. That gap is actually getting a little bit wider as we go along. And uh, today, that gap is around $70 billion. That means Ontarians are producing $70 billion less in goods and services than we're capable of, given our population and our productivity. Uh, and in that light, it's no wonder that we face a, a deficit issue. And uh, the way to fix it is to put people back to work, uh, producing goods and services, generating the income that we can use to pay our taxes. Here's a little bit of uh, simple math. We're $70 billion off of where we could be in terms of our uh, actual output. The provincial government consistently takes in about 17.5% of each dollar of GDP in the various taxes that it collects. Provincial income tax, sales tax, corporate income taxes, and the other taxes that uh, the provincial government takes. So, who's got their <laughs> Blackberry, their Made in Canada Blackberry with a calculator function? Somebody out here, pull it out, pull it out, 70 times 0.175, okay? This means, this is called, you be the economist. <laughs> this is the section of the Oprah Winfrey show called, you be the economist. 70 billion times 0.175. 12 billion. It's about 12 billion. About 12 billion, all righty. We've got a bunch of economists in the room. In fact, 12.4 billion dollars, uh, and more specifically, that's what we would be collecting if we were producing what we were capable of producing. Okay? No muss, no fuss. What's the current estimate for this year's provincial deficit? $11.8 .8 billion. So there, you've done it. You've balanced the budget and you've got a little bit of change to throw around on pre-election goodies while you're at it. Okay? So uh, there's the reality. Put people back to work producing what we're capable of and we will absolutely be able to pay the cost of our public services that we need that uh, contribute so much to our quality of life, and then some. And uh, the same math, the same exercise can be uh, conducted if you look not at GDP per se, but if you look at the number of people working in Ontario. This is a graph that shows something called the employment rate. It's the opposite, in a way, of the unemployment rate. I don't like the unemployment rate as an official statistic because it gives you a really misleading idea of what the labor market's like uh, for this reason. If you give up looking for a job, right, then you're, quote, not in the labor market, according to the uh, nerds who work for Statistics Canada and uh, calculate these things, okay? Then you disappear. So you're not unemployed if you're not looking for a job. I know that sounds bizarre, but it's true uh, by Ottawa's uh, official standards. Um, I prefer to look at the other question. Are you working or not? Okay, I don't care if you're putting in 50 pointless resumes a week okay, for jobs that don't exist. The fact of the matter is uh, you're not working. And uh, this measures what proportion of the working age population is actually employed. And in the decade leading up to the crisis, in Ontario, it was around, on average, 63.5% of the working age population had a job. Working age population means anyone over 15. So again, that's a very conservative definition as well. So that was going along fine. Then look what happened uh, in the recession. We fell down to 61%. And then we've kind of bounced along the bottom ever since. Eh? There's been hardly any recovery in that measure at all. Uh, that's why I say from the labor market perspective, there really hasn't been a recovery. And if you look at that gap between uh, how many Ontarians should be working and how many are working, we are missing a quarter million jobs. Okay, what that means is if we had been keeping our population, which is growing, remember, our population is growing, but if we had been employing it at the same rate as we were beforehand, uh, we would have a quarter million more Ontarians working today than, uh, than actually are working. Uh, so let's do exactly the same uh, exercise. Well, this is another way to look at the same uh, trend in the labor market. This shows uh, income generated from employment. This is wage and benefit income salaries, etc., for people in Ontario uh, who are working. And on average, the trend uh, was growing at 5% a year. We fell off uh, that trend with the recession, and the gap in labor income is $52 billion below where we should be. What that means, if you took those 250,000 Ontarians who should be working but aren't, and put them to work, given average wage and salary levels, they would generate $52 billion in additional labor income. 
So uh, we'll do the math again. $52 billion in lost labor income. Well, immediately at the middle class income tax rate, you're going to collect $5 billion additional provincial income tax revenue. Then, assuming that these workers, like any good God-fearing Ontario worker, goes out and spends every damn penny of their after-tax <laughs> income once they've got it, okay, then the government loses another $3 billion in HST revenue, and uh, there's also a billion dollars lost in the employer health tax, which is collected at 2% of payroll uh, in Ontario. So, again folks, this is why I got a PhD in economics, 5 plus 3 plus 1 <laughs> equals $9 billion in lost revenue directly just from the jobs. Just putting those people back to work immediately delivers $9 billion in revenue uh, to Queen's Park. And the deficit uh, is 11 and change today. And that isn't even getting into any of the indirect effects or any of the uh, corporate taxes that are collected, etc., etc., etc. Just from putting Ontarians back to work, you absolutely would solve uh, the deficit uh, problem. Uh, we wouldn't need uh, any kind of permanent downward shift in the level of public programs. We wouldn't need to reinvent or privatize our public programs as uh, Don Drummond and so many others uh, have been ar arguing, and there certainly is no need to trample over the uh, legitimate democratic rights of teachers and others to freely negotiate their collective agreements. There is no economic or fiscal justification to take away rights from Ontarians. All we have to do is put Ontario back to work, and we will pay our bills, uh, like the hard-working, decent uh, people that we are. So, increasingly obvious truth number three, maybe not quite as obvious as the first two, uh, we'll need to convince some people of this one. The austerity that has been the misplaced response to this crisis uh, is self-defeating. It contains within itself uh, the seeds of its own failure, if you like, uh, and in an extreme case can actually make the deficit itself worse. And the logic of it uh, is obvious. We've shown it was the recession that caused the deficit. So, if you respond to the deficit, by slashing programs and laying off public sector workers, well, what are you going to do? You're going to make that recession worse. Okay? Obviously, if you take billions of dollars of spending power out of the provincial economy, and whether it's through actual layoffs or just by not replacing vacancies and attrition, you eliminate thousands of public sector jobs, well, you've obviously made the underlying situation worse. Um, at best, the savings that you were hoping to get by doing those things through that cold bath on the overall system are going to be offset in part by the negative macroeconomic side effects of the spending cuts. At best, in other words, you're swimming against the tide. You might think that you took three strokes forward through your cutbacks, but you went back one or two strokes because the negative impact of the cutbacks on the overall economy pull you back. That's a best case scenario. The worst case scenario is you actually end up swimming backwards because the side effects of the spending cutbacks and the public sector layoffs are so severe that you end up tipping the whole economy back into the recession that created the deficit in the first place. Talk about shooting yourself in the foot. Okay, that's exactly what this is. Uh, the simple-minded attack on public programs can actually make the problem worse, which makes you think maybe these austerity measures were not intended to get rid of the deficit in the first place. Okay? Here's another brilliant insight. Okay? Maybe this actually isn't about the deficit. Maybe it's actually about something else. Namely, taking away stuff that they would like to take away on any given year of any given century. Okay? And haven't liked uh, anyways. Uh, things like uh, collective bargaining rights. Things like uh, publicly delivered uh, health care. Uh, things like the other things that we fought for uh, for decades. Now, in much of the rest of the world, they're starting to recognize the errors of their way. And in particular, people are finally waking up to the fact that austerity in Europe has been an absolute economic and social catastrophe. Okay? The Eurozone is in recession today. The UK is now in its third recession since the crisis hit. You've heard of the double dip recession. The UK has a triple dip recession. This is the third time GDP in, in Britain has started to decline because the cutbacks there have been so severe. The worst of all, of course, is what's happening in Greece and the other southern countries within Europe where unelected dictators, that's literally what they are, unelected dictators are demanding uh, dramatic changes 
not just in public spending, but in labor laws, uh, in uh, industry regulations, again, in all kinds of things that have no direct relationship to the deficit. But this is a chance for the EU bureaucrats or the uh, international bureaucrats to demand through this thing in Greece that's called the Troika, to demand these incredibly far-reaching changes uh, to Greek society, all justified by the deficit. But the problem is, uh, it's making it absolutely worse. The more they cut in Greece, the more the economy shrinks. In the last year alone, the GDP in Greece shrank by another 7%. Uh, so what that means is the pie that you collect taxes from to pay your deficit is shrinking faster than you can actually cut the spending. And the deficit actually is getting worse. Uh, so it is uh, absolutely perverse. In the US, uh, they realized that that's what would happen. And that's what this whole fiscal cliff debate was about. The fiscal cliff in the US was a political compromise from uh, a year and a half ago where the uh, Democrats and the Republicans couldn't agree on a long-term plan so they put in place these measures that were automatically going to come into effect on January 1st that would have dramatically reduced the federal deficit but the problem was even the mainstream economists in America realized no this would be a catastrophe this would put the US back into a recession just like Europe is already back into a recession uh, so luckily they averted it in Ontario, though, we're still singing from the same hymn book. We came to the party late, okay? There's no doubt that Ontario took a relatively um, mild-mannered approach to handling its budget deficit in the first couple of years of the crisis compared to uh, many other provinces. But now that we're there, now that we've suddenly started drinking the austerity Kool-Aid, they started drinking it right after the last election. Okay, and I still can't make sense of this uh, poli politically. Maybe somebody in the audience can help me understand it. But they, they got a minority government. They knew they had to work with the NDP to stay in power. And that's when they discovered true austerity religion. Okay. Uh, this is when the whole Drummond thing came down. This is when they suddenly uh, committed themselves to uh, uh, all of these interventions in uh, labor law and collective bargaining. And it's been all downhill for them since. This is, it's not just economically self-defeating, it's clearly been politically self-defeating for the Liberals. They're way less popular than they were uh, when they started this whole thing. Yet, who knows? We'll see uh, if this change in leadership does anything uh, or not. Uh, so far, they claim to be true believers. This, again, is more evidence for the case that this is not actually about uh, the deficit. This is a comparison that shows each of the ten provinces plus the federal government. And the first number beside each jurisdiction is the size of the deficit that they were dealing with in 2011 as a share of GDP. And then the second column shows you the size of the cutbacks that they're <coughs> contemplating over the uh, three-year period, 2009 through 2012, again measured as a, a share of GDP. And Ontario's deficit is the biggest, in fact, uh, last year of all the 10 provinces. Uh, uh, their cutbacks are substantial, almost 1% uh, of GDP over just the, that three-year period. More cutbacks in store for the period beyond. But look at the other provinces. Even provinces that had uh, balanced budgets or surpluses were cutting back their spending uh, as well. In places like Saskatchewan and uh, Newfoundland, oil revenue is very strong. Their budgets are in good shape, yet they were cutting back their program spending in the guise of uh, fighting deficits uh, as well. It was, again, no correlation between the size of the problem and the strength of the austerity medicine, uh, which again makes me think that the austerity is being promoted for reasons other than uh, balancing the budget. Now here's a, a true shocker. Even the International Monetary Fund, okay, not typically a hotbed of Bolshevik thought, uh, in my experience, okay, is even saying austerity is misplaced. Uh, you know, I mean, they weren't the, the worst of the austerity boosters over the last few years anyway. <coughs> now they're coming out and actually saying that uh, yeah, austerity has done more harm than good. And their own leadership now admits that their economic models really underestimated the damaging side effects of the spending cutbacks, the stuff that we were just talking about. If you uh, cut spending, take purchasing power out of the economy, lay off public sector workers, you're going to make the economy worse. And that's going to have a cost. Um, at best, that will undermine the savings you were hoping to get. At worst, it can actually put you back into a recession, and that's exactly what's happened in Europe. The IMF now recognizes that the, uh, what they call the fiscal multiplier, <coughs> that means the impact on GDP from a cutback in government spending, is about 1.5. Uh, what they're saying is that for every dollar that's cut 
in uh, program spending, GDP will shrink by that dollar and by 50 cents more because of the negative side effects. Because of course, teachers and garbage collectors <coughs> and other public sector workers spend their money. So it's not just their money that's gone, it's the money they would have spent uh, on goods and services that's also gone. And by the time you add it all up, uh, you've lost $1.50 of GDP for every dollar that you save. And remember, <coughs> government itself would have collected some of that money back. Okay, government itself would have collected some of that money back. In Canada, the overall government sector collects about 40 cents, 35 to 40 cents of each dollar of GDP goes to the various levels of government. So the 35 to 40 cents out of the dollar 50, you've just lost at least half of the dollar you thought you'd saved in the first place, if you can follow my logic at this time on a Wednesday evening. Um, and that 1.5 multiplier is consistent with the evidence that was there before. Yet, these advisors told government, cut back on austerity, cut back the programs, uh, balance the budget at all costs, and the economy will thrive as a result. They were absolutely lying uh, on the basis of past uh, experience. In Ontario, this, this problem is called fiscal drag. What a drag! Okay, what a drag indeed. It's called fiscal drag. That's how economists refer to the negative side effects of the spending cuts. Uh, we, as I showed you on that table, we're looking at provincial program spending cuts equal to about almost a percent of provincial GDP, okay? And that was just up to 2012. There could be more in the pipeline afterwards, uh, depending on what happens, okay? Uh, remember, federal and provincial program spending is declining as well, okay? We are, it's not just the provincial level that's on austerity mode. Take the total cutbacks and multiply it by 1.5. Okay, the multiplier effect, and you're looking at fiscal drag of something close to 3% of GDP. That won't all be experienced at once, okay, because the austerity uh, comes in over time. It'll be felt over some years, but we don't know how many. It could be worse than that. Depending on what's happening elsewhere in the economy, taking 3% of GDP out of the equation could indeed uh, put you back into a recession. And then you don't know what you're going to set in motion in terms of the um, decline in the economy and what that does for uh, provincial revenues. To show you this is not an abstract hypothetical scenario, this graph shows the change in each of the major components of Canada's GDP. We don't have the same numbers for the provinces, so this is for Canada, over the most recent year that we have data on. So this graph shows the change in each component of spending in the 12 months ending last fall. That's our most recent GDP data. And over that 12 month period, you see consumers in Canada, even though they're up to debt, they're up to their eyeballs in debt, we're still willing to go further in debt and spend a little bit more. So their uh, consumer spending grew by 2%. Spending on housing was still growing. Now we know that that's turned around, right? And the housing market in Canada is now shrinking. So that plus is going to turn to a negative. The government sector was already contracting, down by 1% in terms of its uh, activity in the year ended last fall, and that is probably getting worse as well. Business investment uh, was growing at 5%. That's relatively quick, but from a very low base. Business investment is still much weaker than it was before the crisis uh, and has a long ways to come back. Exports were actually declining. So the total change in GDP is a weighted average of all of those different bars. And it was very weak last year, around 1.5%. And that was for a year as a whole. By the end of 2012, that had <coughs> slowed to almost zero. We were almost in a zero growth situation. And if that's where we were at, then a big negative on the government side, uh, because of the austerity, could absolutely tip the balance and push us back into a recession. And once we get back into a recession, then you're getting the declining revenues uh, that created the deficit in the first place. So that's what I mean when I say austerity can be self-defeating, and in fact it may very well be self-defeating uh, even in our context. Uh, all that takes me to one not obvious question. I've gone through what I call the obvious points of recent history, um, and that leaves us with a question that is a challenge to us as well as to the system, and that is how do we put Ontario back to work. If we agree that uh, putting Ontario back to work is the best way to solve the deficit, and, and I uh, passionately believe that to be true, then um, putting Ontarians back to work is the question that we should be turning our attention to. Uh, 
Instead, we spent the last year as a province pointing fingers at teachers, right? I mean, were we actually getting anywhere in terms of addressing the true problem? Not remotely. Um, so uh, it is a challenge. It's a challenge because the traditional engine uh, of our economy, if you like, uh, has been uh, stalled uh, for a few years. Uh, we have uh, the manufacturing sector, of course, which London uh, realizes painfully uh, has, uh, uh, has been through a catastrophe and has, uh, uh, is starting to turn around, but not remotely uh, strong enough. Business capital <coughs> spending uh, on new equipment and machinery and technology is inadequate. Um, especially given the huge cash flow which businesses are receiving, all the tax cuts that we gave them, they're sitting on the money uh, more than they're spending it. Uh, you've heard about this problem of dead money, as Mark Carney called it. Uh, it's now about $600 billion. Can you believe that? $600 billion, enough to wipe out the federal debt in one fell swoop that companies are sitting on. Cash flow that they receive, but they have done nothing with. If we could get that money flowing in the economy again, uh, we'd be in much better shape. Our exports uh, have been terrible. Uh, the federal government thinks all we have to do is sign more free trade agreements. Yet the more free trade agreements they sign, the worse our exports become. <coughs> They're completely missing the problem in our exports, which is about deindustrialization and the failure <coughs> of Canadian companies to produce goods and services that the rest of the world wants. So far, our bacon has been saved by consumers uh, being willing to spend like drunken sailors, okay, <laughs> even if that means going into debt. And now they're all being browbeaten and saying consumers don't go into debt anymore. So if they stop spending, what's left? The only thing left is government. Uh, what we need to do now is look at that problem of the, the missing engine in our economy, uh, if you like, and think about ways that we can put people uh, back to work um, that, uh, that address the fundamental problem of uh, the economy. And the mainstream uh, economics profession uh, doesn't want to do that. Um, the left wants to do that, but um, you know, I think honestly we'd have to say we aren't prepared uh, yet to do that. We, uh, we can critique what's going wrong out there, but in terms of uh, putting forward a comprehensive, progressive vision of job creation, um, we need to do some more work. It certainly requires more than just resisting austerity. Resisting austerity is absolutely important. But if we identify correctly, in my view, uh, the economic failure as the source of the problem, then we need to have a whole vision of uh, how we put uh, Ontario uh, back to work. Uh, I'm just going to skip through a couple uh, more slides here. What would a progressive jobs agenda look like? What would be the components, uh, at least the broad components, of this uh, progressive vision for how to put Ontario back to work? Well, the first point, obviously, is you don't want to make things worse, okay? And this is where resistance to the downsizing of the public sector is uh, very important because it will make things worse in terms of the uh, employment crisis. And in some cases, we can start to assemble and make an argument that not only should the public sector not be downsized, there's actually more work that we need to be doing through the public sector uh, to address social needs that we face. And by the way, one benefit of expanding public services rather than cutting them is the jobs and incomes that are generated as a result of that. So I'm thinking of areas like home care, for example. I'm thinking about areas like uh, early child uh, education, uh, where we still have huge gaps. I'm thinking of areas like pharmacare, uh, a whole area of our um, healthcare system that has uh, been uh, shoved to the side to allow the private sector to take care of it, when in fact we should be bringing it in-house. Um, public housing uh, is obviously uh, an area that's been terribly, uh, terribly neglected, uh, where we need to be doing more, not less. So we can make the argument for more uh, public programs, not less, um, although once we get to that point, that's when we're going to have to be looking at uh, revenue alternatives. I don't think we have to increase taxes just to balance the budget. We can balance the budget just by putting people back to work. But if we want to expand public services, then we should be prepared to look at different ways of raising more <coughs> revenue from our economy uh, to pay for this. In addition to increased public services, I think there's huge potential in the area of increased public capital projects. Uh, things like uh, infrastructure, uh, things like uh, public transit, uh, for example, things like uh, rebuilding our energy uh, utilities, especially with a green energy uh, dimension. Uh, even things like some of the traditional non-glamour 
uh, public capital, things like uh, sewage systems, which in many cities uh, are terribly outdated and have been neglected. Uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities has said we need a 20-year plan, not just a one or two year, throw some money at the problem and make a few jobs and put up a big sign, right? I mean, if there's one industry in Canada that was booming, it was the sign building industry, right? Saying, please thank Stephen Harper and Dalton McGinty for this repair to the pothole, right? Uh, that's not what we need. We need a 20-year program of sustained capital spending uh, in, order to, um, uh, in order to address those infrastructure needs. And the, the benefits of putting all those construction workers to work and then the spin-off benefits from them uh, would be enormous. Now, <clears throat> public capital is a long-lived productive asset. And like any other long-lived productive asset, you should use debt in order to finance it. So there's nothing wrong with using debt and issuing bonds, especially since the provincial government can issue bonds at 25 or 3% interest rate. But we, do, we should be looking at, at, at uh, uh, various ways, uh, creative ways of trying to fund um, uh, public capital spending uh, in order to take some of the pressure off uh, the provincial uh, deficit. Things like our pension funds, uh, for example, which are desperate to find things to invest in that are secure and offer a decent return. We should be using our, pub, our, our public pension funds or even our private pension funds to finance investments uh, in public capital. It doesn't mean a public-private partnership. You know, that's a, that's a bullshit uh, idea. That's another technical term in economics, by the way. That means hypothesis unsubstantiated by empirical verification. <laughs> Public-private partnerships are definitely in that uh, area. But there are ways we could use pension money in other ways without privatizing anything to pay for capital that is useful in its own right and in the meantime has humongous uh, economic benefits. Ontario has always uh, relied on manufacturing, of course. Some of our key sectors like uh, auto and aerospace and telecom. And uh, we need to have an active vision for how to rebuild those key sectors. Uh, it used to be called industrial strategy. Um, uh, things like uh, the Auto Pact or our aerospace uh, programs that brought the aerospace industry to Canada. Um, it needs to be uh, revitalized. For the last quarter century, governments, for the most part, have stayed away from this. They have believed that free trade was all we needed in order to develop these industries, and they were totally wrong. Uh, when industries uh, experience disaster, like the auto industry did, sometimes they'll come in with, uh, uh, with emergency aid, and that was important, but that is no replacement for a long-term vision for how to build these strategies, and it doesn't happen automatically. It happens by government partnering with business and labor and universities and communities around strategies that can make these industries uh, successful. Germany and Korea have been the two most successful industrialized economies in getting through the uh, financial crisis and the aftermath, and they do this uh, all the time, in all kinds of uh, creative ways. Even emerging economies like China uh, or Brazil use active industrial strategies, not any kind of naive faith in free markets uh, to build their industries, and uh, we need to do the same. Ontario is a resource economy as well as a manufacturing economy. We have a lot of resources. Uh, Bryn mentioned that in, in her uh, presentation. Now we have to develop those in a sustainable way, uh, but we have experienced a problem in Canada where resources have been growing while manufacturing is shrinking. And in general, that's a, that's a negative a trend. We want to protect manufacturing and value-added jobs. But we might as well get the opportunities that are from our own resources as well. And there are many uh, in Ontario, whether it's uh, agriculture and uh, food processing that comes with it, uh, or whether it's minerals, or whether it's a revitalized uh, forestry and forest products industry, which could be uh, coming down the pike as uh, the U.S. housing industry recovers and so on. There are opportunities there. We have to do it right. We're not going to sacrifice our environmental heritage for it. Uh, but there's certainly ways that Ontario could take some of the upside uh, of the resource boom. I also wonder if there's a, a bigger case, in addition to public services, in addition to public capital, a bigger case for public enterprise in Ontario's economy. And this is uh, one that I think uh, is worthy of more research from uh, progressive uh, think tanks like the Center for Policy Alternatives and others. Think back to a company like Ontario Hydro and the role that it played over our provincial history. Um, not just 
providing public services, but actually investing and in building productive capacity and innovating in terms of the technology that was used, all in the name of the people and under the ownership uh, of the people. It was a, an enterprise, it was a, 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 an engine in its own right for provincial economic uh, development. And I think there's uh, ways in which uh, we should start looking at this uh, idea again. Uh, what form it would take could be crown, provincial crown corporations, which are still used in some provinces in Canada for economic development. Newfoundland is making big use of crown corporations. Manitoba makes big use of crown corporations uh, for economic development. Uh, it could be other forms of uh, public enterprise or uh, cooperative uh, enterprise. Um, the, uh, the main thing is, if private companies are getting all this money and just sitting on it, okay, why give them more money? There's no point. That's like pushing on a string. Let's find other ways to take that money and pump it into the economy uh, in terms of innovation and uh, job creation. These, I think, are the elements of a strategy to put Ontario back to work, and that's what would solve the deficit far, far more surely and far, far more constructively than the austerity uh, agenda would. I think we, uh, we can fight austerity, and uh, I do think we can win. Step one is to debunk the flawed, self-defeating logic that uh, uh, the Don Drummonds of the world and the other architects of austerity have been foisting on us. And that was uh, my main goal with this presentation. On a more immediate level, we as citizens, as human beings, just have to reject uh, the social and human consequences of austerity. If they try to cut our program, uh, we just say, no, you can't cut that program. That program is too important to our quality of life and to the cohesion of our communities uh, and push back um, on a sort of visceral level that way. We have to increase the political cost on those who would <coughs> cut first and ask questions later. And uh, we've got good examples uh, of that. Look at what happened in Quebec when the Quebec students stood up against austerity. Very audacious, right? Very in your face. And lo and behold, uh, the government that was trying to do it to them lost the next election. Not solely because of the Quebec students, of course, but that was certainly part of it. And now they've changed the, the political environment. Uh, we have done that to some extent already uh, in Ontario. The Liberals took this enormous right turn after they won that minority government, and they have paid an enormous political price for it. They're last in the polls, and the only way out was uh, to uh, shut down uh, the legislature. Right? Teachers aren't allowed to go on strike, but apparently MPPs can walk off the job whenever the Premier <laughs> decides it's politically convenient, okay? And, uh, and, uh, and for the Premier to resign. So, you know, how will they find their way out of that? I'm not sure, but I do know that the more we make austerity um, politically damaging for those who want it, the better our chances are of uh, resisting it. Uh, and then we have to remind people that the way we pay our bills is by having a job producing uh, honest uh, goods and services and paying our taxes uh, from it, and that we are uh, glad to do that. We have learned from the experience uh, of the world, uh, including in Europe, including in Latin America, including in Canada, uh, that fighting back does make a difference. And the, the fight backs in Greece and elsewhere in Europe, the Occupy movement, the students in Chile, the students in Quebec, the Idle No More movement, uh, which has changed the uh, conversation big time again, uh, thankfully, uh, if we uh, stand back and do nothing and just tighten our belts, well, we're going to subsidize the system until it falls apart again. And that won't be doing anyone any favors. Uh, if we sit back and pretend that the financial crisis was just a bad thing that happened, and we all have to pull together to deal with it, and we don't change the rules of the financial casino, then I can assure you the whole thing is going to happen again. Uh, so there's no point uh, doing that. We should put the system on trial be audacious, uh, cause trouble, get in their faces, uh, if you like, and uh, we can win. That is my conclusion, and I believe it, with the power of people like you. Thank you for fighting back uh, the way you do, and I look forward to uh, carrying on that struggle together. Thank you very much.